So, thank you so much for your <coughs> interesting uh, presentation. I think it's better to listen to our friends and then uh, make um, something like a uh, um, debate and so on. But I, I would like only to say um, something. Um, <coughs> I think it's very different. I think it could be very interesting to, to consider um, this this theme, this argument uh, about uh, the idoneous. Uh, I think the um, this is a there is a very strong connection with Roman law because the bishop also is in this period, also in medieval time in Rome. <coughs> uh, the bishop was the. The role of the bishop was very similar of the role of the bishop during the or during late antiquity. So uh, during the, the the institute of episcopalis uh, uh, audientia, and I think the cura animarum. Our friend has spoken about the, the cura animarum. The cura animarum is really stru structured like a, a sort uh, like a kind of trial. So. This figure of Viridonius is, uh, is like an auditor, like an, uh, an apparitor. So the, the structure is the structure of the trial, it, it, a trial for the, for the aim, uh, for the soul. So we will speak about this. Um, I, I, I introduce um, Tirza Kelma. And she's a PhD, PhD candidate at the Golden Goldstein Goren Department of Jewish Thought, I think, in Beersheba. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the title of the presentation, Joseph Karos writing as a moment of transition in the history of Jewish law. I, I want to figure out how to. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> um. This one, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be talking about Jewish law, halacha, um, and I'm going to start off with explaining one point that uh, will is only one point out of many that uh, Jewish law would be unique. Uh, compared to other kinds of law, but this is one that I think would be uh, necessary for us to start with. Um, the fact that uh, Jewish law regards all kinds of legal issues, personal and public, uh, together with the fact that is it has a theological background um, that makes the system uh, have an inherent uh, tension between the development of a legal system and the necessity for keeping a legal continuity from the Bible and on, makes the question of, the, of authority in the system of Jewish law different than in other systems. And um, because of the pretension to reflect God's command, it would make the difference from other uh, kinds of law. One of the issues that will be affected by this is the relationship between scholars of different eras in Jewish law. This is a graphic uh, way to describe different eras in Jewish law, uh, of the, in the history of Jewish law. This is, I cut this out of Wikipedia, out of Wikipedia. We're going to look at the page this is cut out of. And I, I actually chose to use a source that is as wide and not scholarly uh, developed as wiki because it means a lot about how people think of the history of Jewish law and that's actually what I want to talk about. Uh, a few decades ago, Havlin wrote an important article in which he claimed that what marks the end of an era in Jewish law is the forming of a remarkable text that defines the era. Havlin's article concentrated in discussion about the Talmudic times, the Tanaic era ending with the uh, editing of the Mishnah and the Amoraic era ending with the formation of the Talmud that Ayedit was talking about, uh, if you were in her uh, lecture. Um, he, he put a footnote down asking whether maybe Rabbi Joseph Karo's writings would be similar 
talking about the um, transition between the time of the Rishonim and the time of the Achronim. Okay, literally Rishonim means the first ones and Achronim means the last ones. But speaking of Jewish law, it means uh, the, the earlier scholars and the later scholars. And the question is whether maybe the writings of Rabbi uh, Joseph Caro would be this turning point. Um, before I continue, I want to introduce, uh, oh, I, I will, I'll, I'll keep on with this. Um, this is the page from Wiki, about uh, Achronim. And as you can see, it says here uh, that the, the time of transition is the forming of the Shulchan Aruch, one of the books Rabbi Joseph Kara wrote. This is, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing the way people think of this, because this is, was not research. This is not, it's not as if I'm talking about something that everyone's already thoroughly wa looked into. It's just that's the way people talk about this issue. Um, okay, this is a better way to look at it. Okay, so this is Rabbi Joseph Caro. Uh, he's known to be in, uh, by the scholars as Hamechaber, the author. Um, he, was a very he was very accomplished in his long and productive life. Uh, he was born in 1488 and lived to the vulnerable age of 87. He was not only an author, but also a judge, the head of a big yeshiva for advanced scholars in Sfat, and a halachic authority who was the source of halachic decisions for Jews around the world. But all of his activity pales before the great significance of the two main halachic books that he wrote, the Beit Yosef and the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch literally means the laid table, and it's the code of Jewish law that any later work of Jewish law refers to directly. It is the most known of his books. Nevertheless, according to what he himself wrote in the introduction for the first edition, the Shulchan Aruch is not more than a summarized version of highlights from the earlier Beit Yosef. Of course, it's more complicated, but that's how, it's, how he puts it. As opposed to the Shulchan Aruch that was written within a few years after the process of printing all parts of the Beit Yosef, writing the Beit Yosef was a lifetime endeavor. Rabbi Joseph Karo started writing it in the city of Andrinopol in the Balkan in 1522. The first volume was first printed in 1550. The first editing of the whole opus only ended in 1554, and the whole print project was on, only finished in 1558 when the f fourth... Uh, part was uh, printed. As opposed to the short and technical do and do not listed in the practical Shulchan Aruch, the Beit Yosef contains long and detailed discussions on each and every rule. As you can see in this slide, there are many uh, wide, broad, and layered um, goals to the Shulchan Aruch. What Karl presents as the main goal of the Beit Yosef is making a halachic decision. But that's not what's in the uh, that's not what's on the front of the stage when people think about the Beit Yosef, not only today, very quickly. These two uh, goals, bringing all the Talmudic um, sources and bringing all of the opinions of everyone between the ending of the, of the editing of the Talmud and Rabbi Joseph Karo himself, what would be called would be known as the Rishonim are, the, are, uh, are, are very quickly the main issues people see as the issues of this book. Did he plan throughout the whole time to write the Shulchan Aruch with the, only the bottom line, as Menachem Elon describes, uh, or was he, uh, was he actually only making this decision later on when he finished or almost finished writing the Beit Yosef, this question is more important and more complicated than I can explain now. The bottom line is that within a short time, in terms of history of Jewish law, the Beit Yosef was thought as, as containing all sources earlier to Karo's work. And this book, and more so the Shulchan Aruch, became the basis to any later writing and the reference point for, for every work of Jewish law ever since. This explains why these works are referred to as the turning point between eras and how their formation actually made the shift happen. But let's question this picture. Could Kaoru's book really contain everything written until, uh, until his time? This is the graphic 
uh, picture of how it's thought of. Okay, all the Rishonim are all gathered into Rabbi Joseph Carroll's books, and all the Achronim are writing on what he wrote. Okay, could could this actually be? Um, once the question comes up, it seems obvious that the answer must be no. To us, living in the 21st century, it is also very easy to understand that Carroll's summarizing of writings that were in front of him, as opposed to the writings that were not in front of them, that therefore did, did not become part of everything, okay, everything, quote unquote, um, must be by definition different than the original books that he is summarizing. Okay, there must be uh, a gap. In my MA thesis, I dealt with this question in length, invest, investigating the different sources that Caro used and didn't, or didn't use, and the way he used them. There's, of course, much to be said about this. In this occasion, I only want to relate the specific aspect of this issue, the illusion that the book could actually relate to everything. Okay? First, I want to make it clear that the idea of everything that could be in front of the scholar and be put together has a lot to do with print and the print revolution that was making its first baby steps at this time. Um, it's also a closed circuit. Once the Beit Yosef was published and accepted as a summary of everything till his time, anything that was not in the Beit Yosef became not important enough to print because it was not part of the everything. Um, but a lot of times the, it, it happened because it wasn't already printed and it wasn't part of what he learned because that's what made the everything uh, come together. Um, I, there's another generalization happening here and that's not only everything but also anyone. Okay, The narrative that presents Caro as anyone is one of the main themes in the, his large introduction to the Beit Yosef. Among other things, Caro explains there why knowing all sources of any rule is necessary but impossible. He introduces himself as one that did what everyone should have done but couldn't do. The subtext is that gathering and summarizing all the texts uh, that competent debate Yosef is what each and every reader would have gotten to if only he would have done the job that Karu did for him. Okay, and of course, from our point of view, we understand why that is problematic. Um, this this point of view of Karo's was adopted to a large extent by his readers, and very quickly, the Beit Yosef started being used as a reference book. The name of the book embodies this ambivalence towards this issue. Caro gives two reasons uh, to his decision to call the book Beit Yosef, meaning, um, literally meaning the house of Joseph. The first one is actually almost a quote from his uh, mystical diary, and it means it's his part in this world and the next world. It's his home. Um, the second, ex expl this emphasizes how important it was for him and what a big project it is. The second explanation, whoops. The second explanation, um, Caro compares himself to the biblical Joseph collecting all the grain in, in Egypt. Uh, and the, the, the project of collecting the knowledge to collecting the grain. Um, it takes genius to figure out that the food should be collected, and genius that made Joseph in the Bible viceroy of king of Egypt. But regarding to the food, the role that Joseph plays is, is, that Joseph plays is not creative. The novelty is the form of preservation, but the material is not affected. It's only organized and kept. Um, the narrative is one that puts Caro on the stage and in the shade at the same time. Caro's work is presented as an objective reflection of the halachic work of all the former generation. This narrative is part of what makes it possible to relate to his writings as the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. His writings are viewed as a project that mirrors what already exists and not a new creation. And here I come to a very significant but fragile point. In order to be able to write a magnum opus, that is a transition point in the history of Jewish law, 
the transition must already be happening. A point of view that looks at all what has been written in the last centuries as everything, a whole that needs summing, is already in transition. We cannot know what would have happened with this process if this, these books were not have been written. Um, but without transition already being happening, this work couldn't have been written. Um, in the, an article about the division between the eras and the Rishonim and Achronim, Israel Yuval demonstrates how in Central Europe, known as Ashkenaz in Jewish history, um, the notion of legal Jewish history, the no no notion of transition of authority and etc., all what we're talking about, um, arose after the Black Death in the 14th century. It seems that a similar breaking point can be traced in the communities originated in the Iberian uh, Peninsula in 1492 with the exile of Jews from Spain. The historical catastrophes made the scholars after this traumatic, traumatic historical events relate to themselves as thoroughly different than the generations before the watershed. Caro, which was born in 1488 in Portugal, the family that just left Spain not long before and moved to the Balkan later, grew up with the consciousness of transition that was part of his activities and stood in the, in the background of his choice of goals and forms of, creati in, of creativity. In the short moments I have left, I want to relate to one other phenomena. Um, as we all know, the media is the message. This is a spread out of the first, this is a picture of the first edition of the second volume of the Beit Yosef, printed in 1551. Um, what you see in the middle is the tool that, when we were talking about the different goals of the Beit Yosef, uh, this, this book is the book that the Beit Yosef is written around. This is this uh, goal I didn't talk about before. And therefore, it also explains it. This is the middle, OK? This is the text. And all the Beit Yosef that, as you can see, and this is a typical page is much broader and much longer, is printed as a hypertext to this uh, book. Now, although it's very clear that the tour um, influenced how the way that, uh, that the Beit Yosef was for, formatted, um, that the choice to write a main book that um, pretending to be a hypertext is also part of this process of transition already happening on one hand and causing transition to happen. Because we have on the one hand a book that knows it's so significant and so important, but still knows that the authority is a question and therefore is stuck onto a different book as if it was just a hypertext. And we see a lot of books from now on in the Jewish history being printed as hypertext to the Shulchan Aruch, although they are writings. Now, this is not something he made up. Hypertext existed before. But it's special to see such a huge book. This is a, it's incredibly huge. Um, as you can see here, uh, being printed, cut, masked as a, as a hypertext. So just the last few words. Last few words. Last few words. Yes. A transition, it seems, cannot happen uh, as a one-time occurrence. It must be a process. These books could not have been written if it wouldn't be that transition was already happening. But they also influenced them uh, by strengthening the change. The narrative in the background of the creation of the books, of anyone and everything, are the basis to the next evolutions of Jewish law. Um, Kara's books became the authoritative works that at the same time were related to as if all they were was a good arrangement of materials. The image was a significant part of what was actually happening and not a side issue in the process of the Jewish law arising from these books. Thank you very much. <laughs>